In the second half of our, our discussion here, I'd like to move on and talk a bit about the technology and data when it comes to innovation. And I think we've left that on purpose because this people part is so important that we could talk about it all day. But first of all, do you think that the new ways of working over the last couple of years have affected innovation or is everyone just in a rush to get back to the same old? Um, I don't think that the lack of progress over the last few years comes um, entirely from the way that we have been working. Um, I think the last few years are a little unfair. I mean, effectively around the world, you know, we sort of pressed an emergency bell, told everyone to get out of the office and run for their lives, you know, not to sort of take anything heavy with them. Um, and then for, depending on where you are in the world, for three months to two years, people then sort of retreated into, you know, survival mode, really. Um, it's fascinating to, to talk to people about their workload during the pandemic because there's everything from people who are working harder than ever on more urgent solutions than ever, all the way through to people that had almost nothing to do, but they sort of looked busy. Um, and it's been a very unfair experiment because most companies suddenly went to a sort of coping strategy. You know, it's almost as if people were just trying to keep alive. They were just trying to sort of keep a salary coming in. They were just trying to not get fired. Um, and therefore, the main problem, I think, for the last two years has just been a lack of, of sort of ambitious, proactive, future thinking progress rather than a sort of reactive um, step. I do. Um, I don't know. I um, I'm a huge believer that the way to think about these tools is not to say, you know, we've got Zoom. How should we use Zoom? but much more, right, what is this company trying to accomplish? Um, what process do we need? To, what sort of strategic vision do we need to work towards? What are the steps to do that? And then in each of those cases to figure out the best way to do that. And I think um, for some of those things, actually automation is the way forward. Um, there are way, way, way too many jobs being done by 25-year-olds in a Soho office, you know, getting $75,000 a year. Um, that could actually be done by a sort of macro written by somebody um, in about 10 minutes. Far too many jobs like that. Um, so automation is key. Um, figure out the things that are best done by individuals. Again, you know, we, we talk a lot about where people work, but it's much more interesting to think about how in a holistic way. Uh, we have this love of collaboration. You know, innovation for me so often is about the theatre of innovation where you rent out a room with colourful, sharp sofas, um, put up sort of five mood uh, uh, whiteboards, pull up lots of uh, post-it notes. And the more people in the meeting, the more innovative it is. You know, the further people have flown in, the more important it is. Um, actually, I think most innovation happens on an individual level. Um, I think innovation is, is a much less collaborative thing than we might think. And again, these are, these are unpleasant, perhaps, truths that I'm uttering. Um, you know, so figure out ways where people can come together, figure out ways that people can work independently, uh, figure out ways that people can get inspiration. Or maybe it means just going to your local shitty shopping mall. Maybe it means, you know, picking your kid up from school and having a poke around the buildings if you're allowed to. Uh, maybe it means going to a hospital and walking the corridors. Maybe it means going on a long road trip. Um, you know, whatever it takes to sort of experience the world. Um, and within that structure, I think it will probably become quite obvious that it's very, very hard to collaboratively come up with ideas at the same time but it's probably easier to refine them. It's easier to sell them in perhaps online as well. Yeah, because there was that a big study, actually a colleague of mine was involved in it from Colombia about you know, the, the role of Zoom in creative collaboration. And the, the headline wasn't that surprising, which was that essentially in person, a room of people will generate more ideas than if those people were situated on Zoom all over the place. But then they found actually there was no difference in the quality of ideas selected between either of them. And in, in part one of this chat, we were talking about the role of, of charisma within innovation. And actually that, that strikes me as something that comes up in, in rooms. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. I know what I've experienced and I'm sure I'm, I've been guilty of it dominating the conversation because I think I've got a really good idea here and you set off with that idea and everyone in the room I think is so keen to come out of there having felt that this has been worthwhile this has been yes. innovative something has come out of it and this yeah. guy's standing up and he's got the pen and he's going to talk about his idea let you know there's a deep down sense of let's run with it 
And people don't do that quite as much on Zoom if they can just vote on the ideas and bring things up. So there's a, a blend there, isn't there, where you maybe have that selection process happening differently, or you have people working in isolation before they come to the innovation session, where they, they at least turn up with ideas and they, they, they aren't swayed by one person standing up with the pen and telling everyone else what to do. And another thing they, they said at the end of that research report, and I'll, I'll share a link to it when I, I post this video out, was we haven't tested it, but we've maybe lost the sense of kinetic creativity, if you want to call it that. So if you're in a room, you're with everybody, you can move and so on. On Zoom, like us right now, you're, you're quite fixed. You know, you're, you're looking at the camera, that's what you're doing. What about if you had Zoom with the cameras off and it was just audio and people could walk around the room while they were at home, would they be more inclined or less inclined to come up with new cre creative ideas than in a room? So it's like most research, it just opens up 20 more potential research reports. But I think- <laughs> but it does, uh, and one, one thing to note is um, I often feel like we're judging um, working from home and other mechanisms today a bit like a plane mid-flight without the realization that it had to take off um, because we can have sessions where we can build on reputations that we've established, we can build on trust that we've established, we can build on uh, relationships and knowledge that we have only been able to build in a sort of pre-pandemic world. Um, and therefore it's very different for an 18 year old or a 21 year old going into work today um, where, you know, you learn how to present by watching other people present and not on Zoom. You know, you learn how to dissent by listening to small talk in the back of meetings. You learn how to give people bad news by, you know, gossip. Um, and all of those sort of informal um, but vital mechanisms are sort of stripped away, I think, in this world. So. Yeah, no, it is actually a good point. And I guess a lot of the a lot of the takes on what this new world has meant have come from people who have had the benefit of that, where they're really trading on everything that happened in the real world. And now, well, yeah, it's fine to work from home because, well, yes, I'm pretty comfortable. I can, I can, if everything stays the same, if it stagnates at home here, I'm fine with that because it's going okay. What about the people just starting out who, who need the benefit of all of that? And a second bit I wanted to ask you about on this, Tom, actually, because I, end up talking about this till I'm blue in the face and I'm not sure I enlighten anyone along the way, but <laughs> <laughs> the role of data within innovation. We, we all agree there's lots and lots of data out there and yes, yes, it's a good thing, better than just a gut instinct. And we talk about this, you know, potentially someone leading the charge and persuading everyone of their idea with charisma, but maybe not too much behind it. And the data can maybe be that, that substance. But what do you think, generally speaking, from your experience and what you see at the moment of the role of data in the innovation process? Is it an enabler or is it sometimes a blocker? Um, I mean, everything really is about the precise circumstances and it depending and, and sort of innovation within a pharmaceutical company in particular is a very data oriented thing where you're just trying sort of serendipitous combinations of drugs and seeing which one works. And then when it works, that's a good idea. Um, but that's a bit unhelpful to be so niche. Um, generally speaking, I think we've sort of moved to a new paradigm where we're in love with data and where data gives us insurance. And I think everything about this culture is completely counter to innovation. Um, the particularly killer point is the data can only reflect a current reality. Um, you know, if you were Tesla doing um, studies on the EV market before Tesla, you know, obviously all of the data would show you that people don't really want to buy an EV and EV cars aren't really a good idea uh, and they're going to be expensive and they're not going to go very far. And then you create the reality against all the data. Um, so data is particularly unhelpful and a culture of data is particularly destructive to anything that's sort of wild and unexpected and new. It's a little bit more helpful when it comes to smaller, more incremental innovation. You know, you can um, look to see sort of trending flavors of ice cream and then decide to make a smoothie um, of that flavor. You can kind of look towards uh, I don't know, the sales of um, meatless burgers and then decide you're going to do a meatless chicken or something. Um, so you can sort of use it, you know, to sort of go with the flow. Um, and of course, you can use it to substantiate your arguments. So I think, um, you know, more, more helpfully, the best role with data is to do something that you know is great in your heart. Um, and then when, because it's always when, when required by a company to make a business case, when required by a company to sell it in, that's when you have to use data. Um, because it does appear 
Um, it's really hard within a bigger entity to win an argument on charisma. Um, it's a lot easier in a smaller company, obviously. Um, but yeah, you know, you, it's very, very, very hard for someone to stand up and say, I just believe, you know, biscuits made out of candy floss are going to be great. You know, you have to sort of say, you know, candy floss is trending in South Korea. You know, biscuits are the future, according to um, IBM. Um, and even completely spurious, laughable, um, non-robust data um, will normally allow any argument to succeed because people don't really understand data enough to challenge it. So, yeah, that's kind of where my question was <laughs> was headed. Was that I certainly understand the importance of data. I actually quite like the whether it's apocryphal or not the Amazon approach of if you're going to bring data to the meeting, you need to bring data that disproves your point as well. And mm. it encourages people to see the other side and display two sides of the argument. So I've done my research. These are two things I'm seeing. And this is the reason I believe A to be the case. And I believe that B is not strong enough to hold us back. But, well, at least that, that gives people some structure and, and a reason to bring another argument to the table. Because often I've seen it, it's that charismatic front runner who turns up with the spurious data that they may or may not have made up. And it goes, and of course, the line just goes straight up into the heavens. And then by the time, you know, the results don't happen, they've moved on to the next client or the next gig or, or whatever. So yeah. do you find that there's, I mean, how would you really describe that? Is Do you think, and I won't put words in your mouth, I've, I've given away my point of view, but that there's a, maybe a lacking data literacy when it comes to organizations, given how important it is, do you think that the level of data literacy is where it should be? And if not, how might that be improved? I am staggered by how poor the level of basic um, statistics or maths or even logic. I'm, I'm staggered by the lack of it that I see both in advertising and marketing, um, even in consulting and even in business more broadly. Um, I, I don't really understand it. I was quite a normal student. Um, I was quite good at maths. I feel like I can feel maths. You know, I didn't really have to do any work in it and I did quite well. I got a master's in structural engineering. And, you know, maths is to me is a bit like learning French if you are French. Um, you know, like you can probably get better at it, but it doesn't feel that hard. And maybe it's the choice of sort of meetings I've sat in. Maybe it's the roles I've done. You know, generally speaking, people don't seem to have any sort of instinctive ability to understand it. You know, if you sort of said, oh, you know, 53% of people think it's a great idea, you know, no one seems to turn around and say, well, look, 47% of people also don't agree with this. You know, that means it's not a strong point. You know, the fact you've got a number there, you know, the, no one's asking questions about the methodology. No one's asking questions about um, what other data you found that this disproves that point. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, um, it's completely extraordinary to me. Um, again, I'm not a st statistician, like I'm not very good at the sort of more advanced concepts, but, you know, if, if you were sort of asked to put together a business case to make these, um, uh, what was it, candy floss biscuits, you know, if, if you can find social media analysis in South Korea that shows that people like it, um, the obvious question is there's like 180 plus other countries. Um, did you try to see it there? You know, the fact that you didn't say here at 19 countries where people are talking about candy floss more, you know, that means quite a lot as well. You know, what, what data have you not found? Um, like you said before from Amazon, like what data um, sort of refutes that point? There seems to be no uh, thoroughness. You, you, it's almost like a sort of weird game show where you can just hold up a paddle that says, you know, here's a stat from Gartner, you know, bing, bing, we've won the argument. <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, and most of these data points are actually wrong as well. I mean, the number of them which have sort of, you know, come from methodology no one understands. You know, a lot of the thinking behind plastic straws was based on an eight-year-old um, doing an assignment in school once that somehow went viral. Um, you know, the knowledge of doing 10,000 steps comes from um, the fact that it's a funny word in Japanese or, or, or something like that. You know, like we live this whole world <laughs> based on completely wrong data. But as long as it helps us, we're fine with it. Yeah, that's that is the thing. I mean, if if it is genuinely helpful, it's like you know the five fruit and veg a day in the UK. People were staggered when they found out that that was just a number because someone was under pressure to come up with something. And, I don't know, five. <laughs> it's <got> five. <laughs> parents are slavishly trying to hit the five a day yeah. but, it's, but it does give you something to aim for and it's better than getting two so you know it's it's not a bad thing I just find it strange in 
businesses with such big decisions to make. And it's not always the case. You know, I've worked with some that are very rigorous about this and that demand a lot of this from, from their staff. And they tend to be quite successful, also tend to be in finance, which would make yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. And then you get a lot of people who work in, say, fashion, where there's, there's so much data that you could be using about the trends that are coming up. There's a lot of global things, supply chain issues at the moment that could affect everything. And there are people in the business who are doing that and doing it in detail i'll never understand to be completely honest but then you get to like the marketing department and there's none of that coming through and it is like you say someone calls up a thing and says well i've seen that these dresses are going viral on tiktok you know maybe we should be doing that in three months time and it's like have you got data for that you need data if, if it's not data it's just an opinion and they go well i got 30, <laughs> 37 000 likes and they're like, well that's a lot of likes okay let's yeah. go for it and, and it that's is- yeah, and that's that's kind of it. And yeah, it's it's intriguing. I've been discussing this with some of these businesses and like ad agencies and places like that. Of, of you know, how do you go about bringing that up to a certain level? Maybe it is you know made up data points, like you say, or, or five fruit and veg a day. You need to bring three data points pro and contra what you're saying in this meeting, and you give people that sort of a number so that they at least are presenting that, and you can make your minds up. But then you're trusting people to de- decode it themselves and make their minds up as well, which is another another kettle of fish, I suppose. Um, but yeah, so when you look at the the role of, of technology and data, as we're kind of coming to the, the close of our, our lovely conversation, Tom, any final thoughts on how people should be approaching this whole idea of a culture of innovation and where technology and data fit into this alongside the important role of people? Um, I think um, technology is, you know, broadly speaking, an amazing tool to get more um, and better. And I think what's happened is people have tended to go for more rather than better. Um, at some point, I was going to try and research this to, to, to prove it with data. Um, but I'm pretty sure that more people die of um, drowning than they do of thirst. Um, and I thought when we talk about sort of data being the new oil, like data kind of is the new water in a way where there's so much of it and we're more likely to get in trouble from it than we are to sort of, um, mm. by having too much of it. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's not as pithy as I thought. Um, and I think- no, no, no. I'm, just, this... I'm always nonplussed by things, Tom. I thought that was a very good. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Don't, don't judge things by my face. <laughs> um, it's quite treatable if I work with it. Um, I, I think technology gave us this amazing way to get more. You know, the, the cost of getting data came down to almost nothing. The cost of storing data definitely came down to nothing. The cost of connecting data basically went down to nothing. The cost of processing data basically went down to nothing. And and then companies ended up with all these servers. Um, and there were servers held by different departments. There were servers that didn't talk to each other. There were servers where me, uh, data was measured in different ways, but it was um, recorded in the same way. There were places where it was uh, recorded differently, but measured the same way. And companies ended up with all of this data and it was called big data and no one knew what to do with it. And then we then sort of invented things like AI as a way to sort of glean insights from that data. And now we have all this shitty data being processed by pretty shitty algorithms, giving us stuff which is not that helpful, but because we followed a very advanced process we assume it must be helpful. Um, and we need to do the exact opposite, which is to figure out exactly what uh, decisions are we trying to make? Um, what data types do we need for that? Where do we get that data from that's best? Um, how do we store that data? How do we get that data with permission? How do we ensure that other people around our organization get access to that data? Um, how do we tidy it? How do we refresh it? Um, and I don't know anything about data. It's, it's strange I'm saying things that appear to be quite clever because this is not my world at all, but this just seems like common sense to me. Um, and we'll probably find out that we don't need that much data. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of staggered. If you're trying to sell uh, sort of Porsche 911 to somebody, um, you probably don't need to know that much. I mean, you need to know they give a shit about cars. You need to know that they quite like driving fast. You need to know they've got quite a lot of money. Um, you don't need to know you know, what um, breakfast cereal they like. You don't need to know what newspaper they read. Um, You can probably guess some of this stuff. Um, You don't need to know where they are. You don't need to know how many steps they've done that day. You don't need to know what TV shows they watch. And we need remarkably little data to make most decisions. Um, You know, you see all these incredibly sort of fancy uh, things that can be done, but most of it is way, way, way more complicated than it needs Mm. to be. You know, if you're trying to get a car launched to the mass market, find a TV show about cars and stick a TV ad in it. You know, part of your job is done. You didn't need um, behavioral targeting. You just needed to the context to place it in. 
And strangely enough, that's where a lot of potentially digital advertising is going to head quite soon with interest-based targeting and much more contextual targeting as we lose a lot yeah. of the data that maybe we didn't even need in the first place. Um, for some for some areas anyway. Uh, well, Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Where can people keep up to date with your work? Uh, probably LinkedIn is the best thing. Um, so I think it's Tom F. Goodwin on LinkedIn. I've also got a website. Um, I can't remember what it is. Tgoodwin.co, I think, or TomGoodwin.me. I know people can normally find me. Yeah, they'll find you. They'll find you. Well, yeah. thank you very much for joining, Tom. And thanks, My everyone, pleasure. for watching. See you next time. Cheers.